Hello again and welcome to the Franchise Everything Podcast where we talk about everything and anything franchising and today I'm joined once again by Vanessa Wilmot, the Managing Director of Geotech. Hello Vanessa. Hi Glenn. Hello. Now we're going to talk about um, putting data behind innovative business or putting innovative data behind business decisions and data generally. So this is more of a generalist sort of data thing to give the marketplace some insights into data. So let's start with, I'll give you an easy question to start with. How important is data? That's a very easy question. Well, it's an open question. Put it that way. I'll just have to declare straight away that, um, you know, I'm a statistician. So for me, data is absolutely everything, everything <laughs> and critical. And it's just amazing what you can get out of data if it's used correctly. So mm. to answer your question, uh, data is absolutely critical. Data and even more importantly, what you do with that data, it's absolutely critical in, um, in decision making. So we're pretty much in the modern world, we're swamped by data, aren't we? Yes, So there's absolutely. data everywhere. Yes. Whether you're gathering it or not, I'm sure there are some gathering it a lot better than others. So what do you see out there as far as gathering goes? Uh, I'm no doubt there's more companies doing it better than others. What, what's, what are you seeing with data gathering? It is a little bit of a split, actually. Uh, while some companies gather a lot of data and are making really strategic decisions based on that data and using it really effectively and getting the value out of data, whether it be their own internal data or whether it's data that they've obtained from a third-party professional. Um, some companies are doing it really well and get, and we can firsthand see the results from that and the value they're getting out of it. However, having said that, um, it never ceases to amaze me how many companies out there really aren't using data to their strategic advantage either there's a lot of different reasons for that. Either mm. they are or aren't collecting it or they're collecting it but they're not you know, using it to their advantage or really extracting the value from it. So, so, so when we talk about using it to their advantage, how, mm-hmm. how is a company using it to their advantage? Give, you, give an example, maybe a QSR or whatever like that, or a quick service restaurant. Yes. So yep. what data would they have and how would they use it to their advantage? Okay. So um, a lot of the clients that we work with in the QSR industries are really using data in really innovative ways. So um, historically, a lot of it was based on just looking at, you know, sales data and sales data trends. but really understanding a lot about all the different data sets out there and looking at, you know, what are the key drives of sales? So taking into account all the different things that could impact on sales performance or revenue. So looking at things like um, residential demographics, business demographics, so the type of people not only living around their locations, but um, the types of businesses or working populations, what are the, what is, where's the competition What is, um, you know, the consumer travel patterns and movements from each of their stores? So they're using this type of data for their network planning strategy. So looking at things like um, network optimization of optimizing their existing networks, where to get more bang for bucks out of their existing network and also Mm. using it for uh, new store growth opportunities as well. So the getting bank, better bang for buck out of existing network, is that mm-hmm. in using it for local area marketing or something like that? Is that how they might use that? They, they could be using data for anything really. Mm. Uh, so it can be network planning. It can then feed into local area marketing as well. So by understanding the environment that, for example, a QSR store is located within, then they can then market within those environments if they mm. wanted to do some local area marketing. So, for example, if they – are located in an area that has a lot of um, working activity that's skewed to blue-collar workers, then yep. they might put together, you know, lunch packs for um, for tradies or something like that and do mm. that as an offer throughout the day if they know who their key target market is. So it can be used for a variety of um, – in a variety of different ways for different mm. brands. So. so what sort of innovative data is out there? I mean, part of this talk we were going to have yes. is about innovative data. I know mm-hmm. you work with quite a few innovative data sets. So can you give us some insight about what's out there and what's available? Because Absolutely. And, and a, a question without notice, in the impact of AI on assessing and that sort of stuff, I'm yeah. sure you're probably dabbling in a bit of that already as well. Yes, definitely. And that's definitely a, um, a conversation that we're having with a lot of clients. And I think mm. it's it's coming up everywhere at the moment, which is great. Everyone's talking about Everyone's it. It's almost, talking bo- about it's almost <laughs> boring, isn't it, really? The AI <laughs> not, chat. Not, not to me, Glenn, but, no, of course um, not. No. but yeah. Uh, so I guess um, before going into that, what we used to find was a lot of our clients or people that we did work for, or a lot of companies in general, were placing a lot of location planning decisions or a lot of their business decisions on um, purely just residential demographics. So that is now a data set that's really easily available through the census websites. And it's free. You can and sort of get a lot of the time you can yeah. get it for free. 
Um, but we all know that people don't only make purchasing decisions based on where they live. It's about where they work, where they're out and about during different day parts for different reasons, whether it's to study, entertainment experiences and that mm. sort of thing. So you've got to find other ways to tap into that. Other ways to tap into that. But in thinking about more innovative data sets, so there's a couple um, that have come out or become more prominent in the last few years. So um, the first one is in terms of MasterCard merchant data. So in the past, um, a lot of information was only available, for example, on shopping centres or malls. So you could get sort of information on, you know, what the size of the centre is. Some of them report their moving annual turnover. And a lot of companies um, were using that as a guide, but that's only really good for shopping centre-based mm. types of businesses. So the MasterCard merchant data, it's, it's based on transaction activity of the retail precinct. So it's based on MasterCard data, which covers about 40 percent um, of the market. Mm. And what it is, is the actual real performance of the retail precinct in terms of transaction activity. Um, so the transactions going through, and you can even look at things like average ticket size, so the spend per transaction and what different precincts are doing, and also um, things like growth and decline. So which precincts are, are growing or doing better than they were, mm. say, compared to 12 well, months 40% ago or worse? really strong portion of it, isn't it? Exactly. Oh, yeah. That's right. And the beauty of that MasterCard merchant data is it covers all different types of retail precincts. So it mm. gives a lot of franchise systems or any businesses really a measure that they can use to assess all different types of retail environments, whether it's homemaker centres where things like average ticket size will be more important, CBD environments, mm. um, and also, you know, um, like airports uh, and strip, shopping strip locations. Yeah. So there is now data available for all different um, types of retail precincts across Australia. So how do you get access to that MasterCard data? Is it, it's um, people like through you. Yeah, type of you yeah. so we've actually got a partnership yep. with MasterCard to get to get that um, that information and then build it into our systems. Yeah. Um, the other way that a lot of our clients are using it too is if you think about something like a retail strip and a really long rambling retail strip, uh, what this data can show is hot, um, hot spots or dead zones within wow. that strip too. So mm. say, for example, somebody was wanting to open a store in um, Glenfrey Road, they can see which section of Glenfrey Road is would be best for their brand so they don't go in a zone that's, you know, got hardly any transactions, yeah. maybe it's more um, service-based compared that's to- so such crucial information because you just never would have known, would you? No. You'd think, look, you'd think well, because you're, you're, oh, we're not going off like finger in the air yes, type of thing. yeah. But this just gives you so much more data to dig deeper in and yeah. it's very tightly That's targeted, right. isn't it? So not only is a retail precinct um, good for the brand mm. but is whereabouts in that retail precinct if it is a long precinct because sometimes people will just think or brands will think, oh, we'll just go anywhere in that. That street will be fine. That street yeah. or um, we even see it with somewhere like Chadston. So yep. most brands think, oh, yeah, we've got to be in Chadston. Yeah. But depending on where they are, um, that can so like really make or break a store. That food court might be a poorer performer compared to that other food court exactly. or something. Exactly, like yeah. yeah. So it's taking all that into That's consideration. Very interesting. So, um, so you mentioned that previously was residential demographics mm -hmm. and now we're much more out and about. So the other obviously is what's the other data? The mobile type data, obviously. Yes. So um, what else is available there? Yeah, so the mobile device um, activity data, and this sort of links in a little bit to AI and that sort of thing as well. So trying to determine where the home locations are of those devices using things like AI and um, looking at the where the devices are at night. Um, so the mobile device activity data, what it can actually do is it can plot out um, consumer travel patterns and movements from any location at all. So mm. um, whether it's the home location of the device or whether it's um, looking at uh, where people have visited or been throughout the different day parts, you know, you can center in on a particular store or a competitor's store and, um, you know, look at the consumer travel patterns and movements. And the mobile device data has been a real game changer for a lot of our clients too because, quite honestly, the applications of it are endless. So we've been using it for things like looking at um, catchments uh, around stores. We've been using it for some brands, looking at how transient versus local um, their stores are. So are mm -hmm. people coming from the main feeder roads or are they coming mainly from the main suburban areas? Uh, we've even used it for a lot of um, if there's been road changes. So if someone's, uh, if there's been a bypass, mm. what impact that might potentially have on store sales or the level of consumers coming past different stores and that sort mm. of things too. So is it, so I'm trying to visualise how you're seeing that data. Is it like aggregate data, is it? It's just aggregate data of the traffic past that or how, how does it work? How does it represent? Yeah. 
How does it work? So any um, for any particular location, uh, you can then uh, travel back and look at things like one hour and one one hour before, one hour after. Mm-hmm. So say for example, you've got a store here. Um, what we can actually do is fence off around that store, and anyone that's been in that store, mm. we can then map out um, where consumers have come from and gone to for the so the customers of that store. Yep. Um, say for example, with one hour before, one hour after, or what the home location is for that. So. Um, yeah, it's really powerful it's very, it's very information. Big brother-y. It's very big brother. A little bit big brother, but I, ha- yeah. I must point out that yeah. it's all totally confidential. Yeah. So there's no names yeah. um, attached to it. So it's like aggregated there's data. Like aggregated ID yeah. names yeah. and that sort of thing as well. Yeah. So, Okay. So very interesting, those two. So what, what are the common problems you're seeing then with data? So we've got all this data. Yes. So what are the things you're seeing that most people are struggling with? Definitely. So um, the term that pops into my head first is data paralysis. So the biggest problem we see is data paralysis. So what that is, is um, most companies, if not all companies these days, have got on the data bandwagon. So they're at least collecting data. They're like, we need to be on it. Maybe they were collecting nothing, but yeah. (laughs) Previously, they could have been collecting nothing. So most, the majority of companies are on the data bandwagon. But um, I guess one of the most common problems that we see, Glenn, is that um, this data paralysis that they've got all this data and they really just don't know what to do with mm, it mm. or are they collecting the data in the right way? So they might have heaps of data or is the data taking a long time to maintain and so clean? So it might not even be usable anyway. Exactly. So yeah. some companies actually spend more time, sadly, collecting and maintaining data than they do actually extracting yeah. extracting value from it. Yep. Um, and then they can become more confused than, than, than anything if they've got all this data so um, one piece of advice that we give is, you know, you really need to think about um, not collecting data for data's sake, but mm. what are you actually trying to do with it mm. or achieve with it? And, I mean, sometimes that can be – that's easy for me to say because I love yeah. data, but some people just maybe don't know what they can actually do with it or what uh, yeah. questions to ask. I can imagine – I can picture people almost trying to predict the future about what data they, they think they're going to need yes. so that they yep. go way too big and they actually make it really quite onerous. Yes. Actually probably end up with less data because they're asking for too much. Exactly. And yeah. that, we've seen that happen too. So they're data overkill and then yeah. that's, that becomes data paralysis then becomes even worse yeah. because they're just drowning in all this data and really don't know why or, or what they're doing yeah. with and it. And I know, I mean, I know from a digital marketing perspective, the more questions you ask of anyone to fill out a form or an inquiry, yes. the bigger the drop off. So if yes. they keep asking for more data that they don't actually need, yep. um, then they're going to get less quality results. Definitely. And even then things like saving any sensitive questions to last. Yeah. So like if, if for example, they were trying to collect um, what income their yeah. customers are on or income band, putting that question last rather than first because if they put it first and someone doesn't want to answer it, then they might not answer anything else. Yes. So there's a lot of little, yeah, um, little tricks and tricks things. Tricks to the trade. Yeah. What about privacy with that sort of stuff? Do you have touch on much of privacy with clients and everything? Do they struggle with that? Because there's been quite a few Privacy Act changes, haven't there? Yeah, definitely. And more pending. Yeah, so um, we when we get data, a lot of the time the privacy has already been implemented. So, yep. um, but that is definitely a consideration. So, uh, a lot of clients are very obviously protective of their own customer databases mm. and that sort of thing. So, a lot of the time, um, you know, if they're doing work internally, it's not so much of an of an issue. But if they are providing it to a third party out, supplier, yeah. um, quite often they will somehow desensitize, maybe some or, or make it look a bit more. Private, so they're not, um, mm. yeah. So they can, they're so going, not breaching anything. Not there. breaching anything. Yeah. All right. So, so wrapping up, your advice to anyone. So maybe someone who's not collecting anything mm-hmm. right now, or people that are and are drowning in it. So your thoughts, yeah, as key takeaways. Key takeaways. So I think um, one thing there is, you know, just start start on your data journey. So if you haven't um, gone that far in it, really sort of thinking about, you know, what do you want to ch- achieve. What kinds of things are out there? What kind of data is out there that you think might be valuable for your business Mm -hmm. decision-making? And then when you are collecting the data, what are you trying to get out of it? Um, Really sort of thinking about that. And companies can go one of two ways. They can have analysts internally. But, um, you know, if you set an analyst up with data and it's like data Disneyland, you might Mm -hmm. not see them for weeks. Uh, So it's really giving- They get a bit too excited. They get too excited. So <laughs> you you might find that they don't come back with things that you wanted. So being really mm. clear with your analysts about what you're trying to achieve so they can then make sure the data's been collected the right way, uh, coming up with solutions or answering your business strategies. Yep. Or if the other hand is if you're really not sure or you don't have those capabilities in-house, 
talking to maybe third parties um, that can either, number one, give you advice or they might be able to do the analysis for you and just give you the answer because so that's- So just do a project by project, basically. Project by yeah. project because that's the other thing, um, you know, sometimes, or well, everyone's time poor these days. Mm. So it's about trying to get those answers uh, from the data, not necessarily spending the time sifting through all that data as well. So it's really important, I think, at the end of the day to be able to have data where you can get strategic decisions from that data. Excellent. I think that's a good overview of data. Just a drop in the ocean, really, no yes, doubt. I'm yeah, sure you definitely. could nerd out on it for ages. <laughs> I could talk about it all day, I'm so sure you could. Um, definitely. Yes. All right, Vanessa. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks Great. very much, Glenn. And that's it for another one of the Franchise Everything podcasts. Hope you really enjoyed this. Please like, share, subscribe, do all that sort of thing, and we'll catch you in the next one soon.